Hi, everybody. Welcome back to New York City. We're above the New York Stock Exchange. This is the Cube plus NYSE Wired series, the CXO series at Media Week. I'm Dave Vellante, and I'm here with Andy Pernsteiner, who's the field CTO at Vast Data, the smoking hot startup. Not really a startup anymore. You guys, uh, I think, have achieved escape velocity. Knock wood. We're feeling um, that way. Yeah, it feels yeah. that way. Congratulations on that. Well, I mean, for startup, Renan Halak, your CEO, talks about that you're cash flow positive. I was like, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we were very we were very careful to make sure that we don't grow faster than we can control, right? But it doesn't mean that we slowed things down. It just means that we we focus on efficiency wherever we can. Very Bezos like, but but interestingly, I mean that company, you know, think of Amazon, I mean they lost a lot of money for a long time. It's very hard, I would think, to be a, a, a VC-funded company where they just want to throw gasoline in the fire, grow, 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 and yet you are growing. Mm -hmm. The growth metrics that we've heard are pretty substantial, and yet you're throwing off free cash flow. That is like unheard of, actually. I mean, there's many things since joining Vast that I didn't think were possible that we have done. And so in some ways, I just take it for granted that we're able to do these things. Um, I, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It's definitely not been easy along the way. But in terms of both efficiency and then also just in terms of being bold, right? Some of the some of the projects that we're involved in, most people don't dream of getting involved in until they're much more established. And we just, you know, we place big bets and we stick with it and focus on our customers. Okay, but a lot of times those big bets can blow up if you don't have the right platform, you don't have the right technology infrastructure, you don't have the right field service infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so can you take us on a through that evolution and how you sure. put, a, put that in place? Because it's a real chicken and an egg and it's a small company. You get that opportunity, you dive in and go, uh oh, you know, how are we going to execute? Maybe we better bring in some partners. Sure. And, and we have brought in partners where it makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, you know, interestingly enough, our R&D organization is almost 400 strong now. Um, and we've always focused on R&D as being sort of the core way that we differentiate and bring value to the market. Um, in terms of placing bets, every time we were faced with a, sort of a path to take, we've generally gone towards the more aggressive place. And a lot of it comes down to largely the executive team, um, Renan, Jeff, and others sort of making sure that they were on top of things and, and seeing what the future holds. Jeff is very good at sort of stitching together what he believes the future will hold, and he's been right often. Um, and I think Renan is able to boil decisions down to their most sort of, uh, you know, we'll call it concrete elements where we can really sort of focus in on the exact things that are necessary to achieve the goals. So we don't waste a lot at the edges trying to get to that skyrocketing goal. We just put everybody in that direction. And, I think I've never worked anywhere where the R&D organization is so tightly woven into how we meet with customers and how we deploy customer solutions. I sit in between all of these organizations and I've been here for a while and I, I, I've never felt like the R&D organization was so aligned to the company's goals. So let's explain to the audience, what is VAST? Because VAST is, is VAST, it's ever changing and yeah. the name is apt. Um, so you guys started out, we knew you as a storage company, a, kind of great file system. You've got this OEM deal with HPE, which kind of solidified that position. We said, okay, yep, we get it. And then last year, you guys kind of announced a, a, a data platform. And this year, we're going to talk about Cosmos. What is Vast? Well, you know, since I started, and I actually joke with Brendan, I was never going to join another storage company. I've, I've worked for storage companies before, and it wasn't of interest to me. Uh, and so he had to convince me that there was a path and a vision for the future. And we were always about being a data company, not about being storage, not about being infrastructure per se. And so the evolution actually is very natural. Um, if you think about it, if you want to do something that's next generation, and especially when it comes to AI and machine learning, data is one of the most important things that you can sort of make sure that you have and can maintain and can curate. And so it needs to be stored somewhere safe and it needs to be stored somewhere that is highly effective at being able to be processed quickly. So it made sense for us to start there. That was a very hard problem to solve and we figured if we start with the foundational levels, we can allow all of the other things to stack on top very easily and naturally. And so when we evolved, it was just really a natural evolution. We started with the data store, which is effectively where store or data can be stored. But you have to kind of 
move your brain a little bit past what storage even means. Storage doesn't mean files and objects or blocks, tables. It means, it means bytes of any kind. So whether it's uh, you know, file and object data that's unstructured or whether it's structured data in forms of database tables or in forms of messages. So if you think about messaging systems, all of those things require storage. We're providing the most effective and cost efficient means at storing all data. And we're naturally in a good position for that data to be processed in situ. And it's not just about operational efficiency when it comes to processing time or in terms of being close to the data. It's also about understanding the data well enough to make better decisions. So when new data lands on the platform, regardless of what kind it is, we know enough about it that we know what to do with it next, whether it's move it to another location so it can be processed in terms of a GPU inference or training job, when it comes to annotating it with metadata that's more contextual so that other people can make decisions on it. All of those things are just done more naturally when everything resides on the same platform. And so for us, all of this is an evolution. And so when we started out with the data store, we basically captured a large share of the market in terms of who needed cost-effective, high-performance storage so they could go and do the next thing. Once the data is there, we can layer the services on top. And the structured use cases are really just the next step. So we, we focused on analytics a bit when we released our database about a, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and what we've seen from an adoption standpoint is people are already taking that and using it to leverage for building the next generation of their AI pipeline. So the data store and database meld very well in terms of storing the data. We are implementing our own ability to pass messages both internally and externally to the system so people can start to derive pipelines on it. And our announcement most recently with NVIDIA is that we're, we've created what's called an insight engine, which is the deployment of actual uh, embedding and other models directly on the platform so that as the data flows through the system, uh, embeddings can be generated, inference can happen, and it doesn't need to be managed by external services. You don't have to worry about data lineage, lineage or sovereignty because it all resides in the same place. So it, it, it's really a natural evolution. And in some ways, I'll say, we did get lucky in terms of timing. Well, yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's become a purpose-built you know, AI data platform. Yeah. Um, and you say it's a natural progression, and, it, and that was the way you described it, but I think, about, I think about storage companies of the past, and the big advantage you have is you know, you're not a box company, mm, right? Yeah. That's, and, and so, I mean, look at, you know, EMC was the, you know, the king of storage and then it bought Documentum and it bought VMware and yeah. it bought Greenplum and it bought Isilon. It just kind of became this collection of stuff. It wasn't a platform. Right. They had a lot of products. Right. And then ultimately couldn't survive as an independent company. So, you know, we'll see where Avast is in 25, 30 years. But, <laughs> but, but, but the point being that platforms today beat products and you guys have a platform mentality. Um, and just like you say, kind of the timing was fortuitous and you've done very well with a lot of these alternative GPU clouds. Mm -hmm. um, doing, you know, super there, we had uh, Lambda on today and many of other, I think you guys are in CoreWeave and, and a number of others, Genesis, I think we had a yep. breakfast at GTC or a lunch at GTC with those guys. Um, and you talked about, I think it was last week, Vast Cosmos. Yeah. You're vast, little old vast, organizing this ecosystem you had, it was amazing, you had in, in NVIDIA, you had uh, 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 Chen Zuckerberg, you had, there was Service Cisco, now, there was XAI, ServiceNow, yeah. XAI is a big, XAI, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that, but that, that you were able to uh, organize that community, I think says a lot about, you know, your chops there, but let's talk about Cosmos. Um, there was the NVIDIA announcement, mm -hmm. uh, Vast Insights. The, the, what's it called? Vast Insights it's with NVIDIA. It's a data insight or insight engine. Sorry. Insight yeah, engine yeah. with NVIDIA, um, and and this community. Those are the two big announcements: insight engines and this community, which um, had some real luminaries. Uh, but that was a big announcement. You guys are make big bold announcements. So. We we like to go big and bold, and we like to live up to all of the things that we announce. Um, I think Cosmos, you know, it evolved. At first, it wasn't necessarily starting out as a community, but when we realized what we were building, we thought, well, we have all of these customers and partners who are leaders in this space, and it doesn't make sense for everyone to operate in silos. Of course, everyone's going to compete. That's just the way that business operates. But in a lot of ways, we can all learn from each other, right? And so. Part of what we're working with these founding members of Cosmos to do is to allow them to share their best practices when it comes to building out the next generation of platforms, the next generation of AI data centers, the next generation of pipelines, because this is not a space that has a lot of history. 
And so there needs to be pioneers who are putting themselves out there and explaining to people how this is going to work. Otherwise, the rest, you know, you need the entire world to be behind it. And the only way to do that is to partner with all of these organizations. And so we started it, but, you know, we don't need to own it, right? But we want it to be owned by the community itself. And so we're just jumpstarting it um, and making sure that people have a collaborative place to share their innovative ideas and stories um, where we can start to allow for sharing of data, including potentially models and other applications in a sort of open place. Now we're here at the, the NYSC Tech Summit. You were speaking on a panel today. Um, give us a sense of the vibe of that. We had a cocktail reception last night yeah. on the uh, stock exchange floor, which was very cool. They, right under the bell, they set up a bar. That was kind of really nice little yeah. venue. Yeah. Um, and, and you've got a number of tech executives uh, in today. You were speaking to a number of them. What's the vibe like there? Well, the vibe is that there are, we're now starting to turn a corner in terms of operationalizing AI. Um, you know, I, I know you've probably seen in the news, Salesforce, ServiceNow, they're kind of pioneering this whole, the agentic sort of uh, portion of AI, trying to move things forward so that people aren't just interacting with chatbots. They're starting to allow agents to start doing real things, real concrete, useful things in business and in the rest of our lives. And I think it's starting to actually become more what I would consider to be mainstream. And mainstream to me means that the average person within a business is going to be using AI every day, even if they don't know it. Um, and that's where I think it's really exciting. Um, you know, there's people across all different industries who, who are represented here. And I think that the, the, the consensus now is that we're moving you know, we're moving through the experimental phase, and we're now we're getting down to where it's actually going to make a real difference. I, I think so, I, and I hope so. I, I agree with that. It's just a matter of really when, but I, I would make this observation, and I have a question for you, is we, right now the agent landscape is benefiting from the rising tide of foundation model functionality, which just keeps getting better and better and better. And then you also have the agent tool vendors. You mm -hmm. mentioned ServiceNow, Salesforce, you know, Oracle's another one. Um, and, and others that are building these agent frameworks and data clouds and harmonization layers and, and, and et cetera. My question is, where do you guys fit into that? Yeah, I think that for us, where we fit in is obviously a lot of the foundation model builders, they still need to do the heavy lifting in terms of training. Whether they open source the model or not, uh, they, they still need to do it. And it's not getting cheaper and it's not getting easier. Uh, we're there to make sure they have a platform to do it more easily, right? Uh, you know, we, we talked about XII earlier. We're the foundational platform where they're training the next version of their foundational model. And it's not easy to do these things. And so we want to make sure that the big model builders can continue innovating um, while at the same time working with enterprises so they can actually deploy AI and retrieval systems in production in a secure manner. Uh, part of what our platform allows for is for the tracking of metadata to enable lineage, to enable the ability for the data that you want to retrieve from a retrieval system, um, making sure that you have the correct access controls in place, making sure that if any time an auditor comes and says, why did this agent perform this action, that there is a trail and the trails contained within the platform. It's not that you have to tie together 10 different systems to construct this. Um, and that's that's a gap. If you look at the way that most of these sort of retrieval systems are stitched together, there's a lot of buckets of parts that have to be stitched together with glue code and APIs, and someone has to maintain those, and then they're never in sync. And so our goal is to make it just much easier to deploy these agentic workflows by allowing the nuts and bolts to be taken care of, by allowing the APIs to automatically interact with each other, by making it so that there's one platform that people have to manage and not manage all of these disparate tools. So t tell us more about the XAI collaboration, what exactly are you doing? What are they building? How do you fit in? So there's only certain things I can say because they're a relatively secretive organization. What I can say, and it's all over the news, they built a very large facility in Tennessee. Um, it's it's at, at this point in time around 100 megawatts or so. And vast is the data platform where that data is residing for them to train the next model. Um, and so I think that they, they have a lot of moving parts, and the, I'm sure they'll love to share how they got to where they got to in terms of building it. It's a very, very interesting story. Um, we're there to make sure that we don't slow them down. And I think that's, that's kind of the place that we're in right now, especially with the model builders. They're all in a race, and we want to make sure that we supply the people who are racing with the fastest possible equipment they can have. So you're basically feeding 
the AI for the for the training process. You're the yeah. data platform that feeds the AI. That's right. Why Vast? What are the unique attributes of Vast, uh, with, such that I, I can't do that this uh, as well on whatever? Pick your sure. file storage. Sure. I think that well, the first of which is. If you just compare us file storage to file storage with some other systems, whether it be a parallel file system or another yeah. enterprise NAS, uh, you know, obviously there's pros and cons to everything. From our standpoint, we kind of put everything in one place. So we can perform as well or better than parallel file systems that are complex to manage. We can allow our platforms to be deployed in environments that are enterprise grade, meaning they have proper security, including multi-tenancy, encryption, all of the things that you would expect an enterprise platform to have, we have. Um, and at the same time, we make it easy. That's just on the data storing side of things. But then if you start to layer in all of the other services that the platform offers, it's just a list of things that people don't have to develop on their own. Imagine if you're a cloud service provider and you want to offer GPUs as a service, and you also need to build out your storage layer for both your block store, your container store, your database storage, your unstructured storage. If you have to build those components separately or buy them, those are separate pieces to manage. But if you have a single platform that can expose all of them, that just means it's faster for you as a service provider to offer services to customers because you don't have to build and maintain it. Um, and so, and then if you think about it from the enterprise standpoint, a lot of enterprises are not used to dealing with HPC, for example. And AI and has some parallels to HPC. Sure. It requires people who know to stitch together these massive systems. Well, if you stitch together a massive comp compute cluster, but you give it crappy storage, You've just wasted all that money. GPUs are expensive. And so the most important thing to do if you're an enterprise is to make sure if you're spending however many millions of dollars you're spending on GPUs, that you don't cripple it by putting in a platform that can't store and meet the needs of it. And so we bring AI to the enterprise. We bring enterprise to the model builders, to the CSPs. And we bring simplicity to all of it. And that's really the, the nutshell. How far up the functional stack do you go today and, and do you intend to go and I'm specifically interested in things like, you've got all this data out there, mm -hmm. this you know, unstructured data, structured data, and, and, and it's disparate, it's not harmonized. Is your role to, today to harmonize that data or is that a third party or is it, that something that you aspire to? Sure, sure. I think that there, there will definitely be lines drawn where we want to reserve uh, you know, that, the, the, the higher level functions for partners and for application developers, right? We want to make sure that there's a stable platform where applications can be deployed, where we can manage them in such a way that they don't crash, that they have high availability and resiliency, that they can auto scale and become more performant as the needs are there. Um, when it comes down to intellectual property in terms of deriving value out of the data, we're still going to leave that to our customers to do because that's where their intellectual property is going to be. We just want to give them the fastest path to doing it. Um, and so like, you know, maybe concrete examples would be if you have data coming in from, let's say, your CRM or some other sort of structured source and you have other data coming in in unstructured ways, and you want to do sentiment analysis or you want to do some kind of correlation between those two data sets, we're not going to do the correlation. What we're going to do is give you a place where you can put all of the data and then give you tools to make it easy to do that correlation so that you can add your value on top if that's what you're trying to so do. So it's fair to say that your customers are still pretty sophisticated. Yeah. You're just making their lives dramatically easier so they can be more productive and yes. drive more value. Yes. Do you okay. see that at some point? And, how, and if so, how does that uh, trickle out to mainstream enterprises? So I think, I think that mainstream enterprises, a lot, well, it depends on who you talk to. They're all on different journeys. At the CIO level, they all have initiatives. But if you get down into the weeds of it, um, they're still a little bit in the pilot project phase right now. Um, and I think what we're doing is we're partnering up with other service providers and consultancies. In fact, we have uh, an announcement we made with Deloitte where they're building an AI factory with another one of our partners, Crusoe, um, to basically be able to deploy a generative AI practice for any enterprise. And so while we're not building it for them, we're creating the sort of connective tissue to make sure that Deloitte has a fast path to developing this application so that customers can deploy an enterprise RAG system on their own data in a secure fashion without having to go and learn it all themselves. Because that's 
That's the biggest gap right now in terms of the, the speed of AI adoption is there's a skills gap. There are people who just don't know what to do with it. And so it does, it does benefit them to use a partner who can provide that expertise. It's a great setup. We have the CEO of Crusoe coming on next, Andy. So thanks so much for coming <laughs> on theCUBE. It was great to see you again. Yeah, thanks a Appreciate lot. Appreciate it. Great to see you. All right. All right, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante, NYSE, and theCUBE's continuous coverage. This is day two of our CXO series at the New York Stock Exchange. We'll be right back right after this short break.